So we got an exciting new show today. Um, in the past, we've talked about uh, sales. We've talked about marketing. Today, we're going to talk about a little bit in the finance area of a thing called cryptocurrency. So we've got a great, great, great guest. Neither of us are uh, fund managers or stockbrokers, and we've got a disclaimer coming up. But uh, first, let's get to the show. So, Sheldon, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bruce. So, let's talk first about your background. And uh, while we talk about your background, we're going to put up this uh, disclaimer that uh, this is for informational purposes and does, does not constitute an offer, solicitation, recommendations. Uh, hit pause on your screen to, uh, to read the rest. Thank you. So, what is your background and how did you first um, get introduced to, uh, to cryptocurrency? Was it through Bitcoin? Yes, I, I read the Bitcoin white paper in 2010. Um, I graduated high school in 2008, so I'm, I'm dating myself. I'm a bit young. But um, entering the job market during that period of recession uh, made me ask a lot of questions. And, and one of them was, why is the monetary system in the U.S. structured this way? And ever since reading the Bitcoin white paper, I thought, wow, this is really cool. This, you know, this could be a, a really great thing for the world. And then I put it down for a few years thinking, okay, well, this probably isn't going to happen. There's lots of great things that people try that don't really come to fruition. So um, I kind of lost faith for a short period. And instead of buying, you know, magic internet money, I was uh, investing in myself. I was trying to start a small business. I was working and going to school and, um, I, I still think that was the right thing to do. Um, I, I obviously could have made money if I bought Bitcoin earlier, but I'm perfectly fine with my choices. So um, I went from uh, going to college in music and, and working in consumer technologies for small businesses and large homes. And um, I left that industry and I moved into enterprise IT, moved to Austin, Texas. And um, I moved up very quickly there, just learned a whole lot. And uh, before I knew it, I was uh, doing firewall management at HP. Uh, I moved on to Aero, um, ECS was the division I was under, but um, Aero is a relatively large multinational company. Mm -hmm. um, I went back to HP for another short engagement, and then I moved into a sales position at the beginning of COVID, and uh, that didn't exactly work out. There was one in between that I'm leaving out, um, but we could talk about that another time. There's um, a decent bit of experience I've had along that way. Um, on the sort of Fortune 500 side of how to defend from cryptocurrencies, how to understand that, you know, cryptocurrencies are not wanted on the corporate network, right? So that was uh, kind of the beginning of my realization that, wow, I do actually need to participate in this. And in 2014, um, we were basically asked, hey, how can we defeat people using uh, CryptoJacker software? It was very popular at the time to mm -hmm. use just one little Chrome tab in the background to mine crypto on somebody's computer. And um, as a managed service provider agent, uh, I was tier three. We had to figure out a way to defeat that. And um, I noticed that only a few organizations were working on ways to help us sort of fight that battle. Uh, one of them was Cato Networks that I'm not affiliated with. And, um, and they were providing free information. So I just started looking into that. How do they get that information? Um, you know, who else is using it? And um, it, it kind of pulled me back in from that day that I read the white paper to say, wow, okay, so... You know, this might not be something that's comfortable for corporations right now, but it definitely exists out there in the wild. And um, and I started participating again. I, I mined a little bit in 2014. I lost it. <laughs> and then I bought back in in 2016. And ever since, I've just been studying the space and reading tons of white papers. And um, the, the technical analysis that I do isn't charts. It's not TA. Um, usually, my technical analysis is downloading a uh, blockchain wallet behind my firewall and then capturing what the traffic looks like um, on that firewall to see how that wallet is interacting with the outside infrastructure. So, I, so I've built a community around that. System, is that what you're saying? Is that what the, what the monitoring is doing? Sorry, say the first part in. It's monitoring outside um, attacks towards your computer. Is that what you're saying? Well, that, that engagement in 2014 was actually from the inside out. So working at a managed service provider, um, we were sort of the responsible party for the network in between for a lot of large corporations, uh, Yum Corporation, you know, Taco Bell, KFC, um, McDonald's, uh, what else? Papa John's was a large client of mine through that organization. Um, they were uh, able to put basically whatever computers they wanted onto that network. And in some instances, because of their um, 
their company's design for that, you know, sort of uh, stub firewall, as it's called, the firewall at those retail locations. Um, you know, small business owners were able to connect miners. They were able to connect their own PCs and do whatever they wanted with an internet connection. Okay. And that's a liability for businesses. So we, we had to address that. It was more of an inside out thing than an outside in. Yeah, because this is kind of what it looks like. Let me pull this up. Um, what it takes to look to actually mine coin. And we're actually we're not going to get into mining coins at all on this show because it's a little bit beyond anybody's realm. But um, let me pick up. Here is some images of Bitcoin mining. So you've got a couple of computers hooked up, right? And the the thing to note in the in the context of that uh, statement is is the age. It's 2014. So in 2014, the sort of uh, corporate scale mining that you're looking at right there with um, application specific integrated circuits or ASICs was much smaller and much less common. CPU mining was a very regular everyday thing. So people were just using regular computers to mine crypto, and, and sometimes that had some uh, some negative effects. And so this is kind of a talk about IT security, about preventing people from getting in to attack for any reason, um, either through some sort of, um, I don't know, phishing campaign, just so they have access to your computer and then you use it as a background, kind of like um, file sharing. Yeah, any any method where you can you know exchange data with somebody else, there's the propensity to sort of misuse it, whether it's links or dropping binaries in the bound. There's there's usually opportunity. That's part of the reason why I'm still in infosec and and uh, cybersecurity because I I see that there's going to be you know demand and, and need for that for an extended period of time. It's just it's a it's a very large ocean to boil, but we're always trying to boil it. Okay, so once um, we figure out the, the security behind it. Um, what are some of the basics of cryptocurrency and why is it an advantage over regular currency, the dollar? So the main benefit, which you could argue stems from uh, ideologies on Bitcoin is sovereign money, is the idea that uh, a monetary system doesn't necessarily need to be directly chained at the hip to a, a government. Um, I know that that's uh, uncomfortable for a lot of people, but simultaneously, the states of Florida and Ohio accept Bitcoin as a payment for taxes. So it's not completely far-fetched for governments to, you know, sort of participate in a external monetary network. But it's also something that's very foreign to the U.S. to say, oh well, of course we're going to accept this thing that's not the dollar. That's not, you know, that's not culturally normal. So it's a significant depart from that. Uh, government oriented currency, but that sovereign money concept means that you're also sovereign to make your own sovereign mistakes. If you um, send a Bitcoin transaction and you forget the last character on the destination address, that money goes back into a pool, it gets locked up forever, effectively it's gone. So when you make a mistake at the you know regular bank, you can call them and ask for support. There's no such thing for, for Bitcoin or really for most uh, cryptocurrencies. So that's the, the sort of trade-off is that you get the sovereign money value, but also you get the sovereign money challenges. And so as far as fluctuations in the market, how does crypto fluctuate? Um, last week it was up to 60, today it's down to 50. Um, is there a reason behind that? Or is it just because it happens? There's a lot of fundamental factors. There's a lot of people in crypto who live and die by uh, TA or technical analysis, i.e. charts. Um, I don't do charting because I'm not a trader, but um, from a fundamental analysis perspective in the short term, um, it's easy to, to, to look at two things. One, uh, there's a, a list of option calls, futures of you know people saying the price will be X that end at the end of the month. Um, and I believe that's actually the last Friday in the month. So that's tomorrow instead of last day in the month. Um, so there's that sort of candle closing, if you will, um, and, and that's a, an important moment on the monthly because normally March is a very red month for Bitcoin and, and it's been pretty nice and sideways this month. Um, also with the end of Q2, um, organizations are going to be required to disclose their financials. So organizations that have been quietly buying Bitcoin in the background might have to be a little bit more forward about it in the next week, two weeks. Um, that's a, a a good short-term driver of you know fundamentals that you could say, hey, 
people are going to have to be talking about this in a different way in a short period. Um, but at the same time, in, in a larger scope, in a, a larger zone of, of time and assets, not just Bitcoin, um, I usually describe the market to people as an amoeba. So it's not necessarily Bitcoin and all the rest, but it's Bitcoin and maybe two others at a time, sort of the, the dominating largest assets. Um, they fluctuate and then the others will fluctuate against them. So I call this kind of a, an amoeba effect or amoeba market, if you will, okay. that there's always going to be one leg kind of pulling the rest of the market in a direction, whether that's down or up. And usually that's kind of Bitcoin leading the charge. And you'll hear people say like, uh, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, that sort of thing. So. And so it has no connection with the real world money market or the real world financial stock market is that what you're saying it's almost completely decoupled there's some very small um, relative points that are worth noting uh, dxy so that the dollar index is one um, the other is uh, just the stock market that there is a stock to flow model because of the amount of venture capital that's in crypto today um, it's it's reasonable to look at that um, because of the the way coin is structured that the um the the inflation model that it depends on relies on the stock market being manipulated by things like the Dodd-Frank Act, which means the government can secretly inject money um, into corporations that need it. And I, I'm not saying this with a tinfoil hat on. I'm I'm saying that this is a, a real regulation that was established um, after the 2009 um, recession. Right. So there's there's some larger monetary things uh, at play there that I'll, I'll freely admit that I'm not an expert on, but I, I have my base level of understanding that. You know, as long as uh, inflationary currencies continue to exist, uh, Bitcoin kind of acts as a um, as a, a compounder, a condenser, a black hole for that, uh, you know, monetary value shifting. Okay. So there's a little, little bug on your on your screen. <laughs> so yeah. as, you, as, you, as you wipe off the screen. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I immediately I am old school. Um, I've been investing in the stock market uh, regularly over the number of years. And recently, um, my broker has been um, <clears throat> introducing me to uh, what's called uh, ETFs, which are kind of a, a fund that will actually buy into some cryptocurrency, although not. I think what they actually do, they buy into companies that are buying into crypto. And so it's kind of a two-step away from the uh, the actual coin itself. Yeah, some people say that that's a, a bad risk model because it's stacking risk. I think you could also argue that it's separating you from risk by making those organizations responsible for their own well-being before you have to worry about your uh, you know your investment collapsing. Right? Um, there's there's two sort of things to note there um, that I think are, are worth speaking. About. ETFs are are definitely useful. Um, there is not a Bitcoin ETF in the U.S. There's a, a handful of them in other countries. Um, but right now, if you want to get more direct exposure than that, and I don't think you need it necessarily. Um, you're pretty much limited to things like Grayscale's uh, GBTC. Again, this is not financial advice. I'm not recommending people purchase this asset. But GTC is a Bitcoin trust. So if you read the documentation on it, it says... You know, the cost that you pay to us to manage this Bitcoin on your behalf fluctuates based on the market, but you get a minimum of this ratio of Bitcoin as a representative holding when you purchase the stock. So that there's not a direct ETF for Bitcoin yet. Uh, Fidelity actually just submitted an application for one. I think it was either yesterday or the day before, but there's been applications submitted in that for the U.S. for many years, and, and they've been continually turned down. I, I think it's only a matter of time before they get accepted. Um, I definitely support, uh, you know, interacting with traditional markets. Um, I traded stocks long before I traded crypto. I, I wanted to have a lower risk portfolio sort of set up and put aside before I got into a higher risk space like cryptocurrency. And um, yeah, I, I definitely support that principle. And, and there's lots of people doing interesting things with digital assets that are in the traditional uh, financial space. You don't have to get into this, you know, manage your own keys and wallet addresses, you don't have to get into all that stuff if your interest is in digital assets, but you want to stay a little bit more reserved. Yep, and that also, um, it's better to diversify. I think there is a quote by uh, Carnegie um, that says, um, "Don't or put put all you can put all your eggs in one basket as long as you keep your eye on that basket." 
So if you're, and again, diversity is probably best. And in most cases, in this case, since it is somewhat speculative, um, it should probably be in a small portion. Um, it's, and who actually, in your experience, who is investing in crypto these days? Is it mostly the uh, the millennials or are there some uh, Gen Xers and, and uh, um, baby boomers? I would see that I would say that I see a pretty good volume of Gen X in the space. Not as large on the boomer side, but there are quite a bit of millennials and Gen Z that are participating. I think that there's there's two sort of inarguable uh, points for that. Uh, one being that young people usually feel like they have you know uh, less to lose or more to risk. You know, hey, I can I can lose my entire portfolio right now and then I'll just start saving again when I'm in my 30s or something. Um, that's not my position. I'm very unfriendly to risk in that way, but uh, that's not most young people. So I, I think that the average young person um, has experienced 2008, 2009, um, has been in some way, you know, affected by COVID, whether it's their parents losing their work, um, their neighborhoods and communities changing, or them actually losing jobs themselves. You know, a lot of people, a lot of the, the younger kids had retail jobs when COVID hit. So I think there's a, a pretty good appetite for risk. But also there's a <clears throat> there's a more renegade attitude in there of not wanting to participate in the system of the U.S. dollar. Um, you know, anyone who grew up sort of watching the U.S. government uh, unfold after 9-11, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I think there's a pretty good, um, you know, case for them to say, hey, I don't feel comfortable with X, Y, and Z because of these things that I've seen from the government. I don't mean to get political, but people take it in, in different directions, and I, I think that's perfectly fine. But there is a, a reasonable ideology of distrust for, um, you know, let's say legacy authorities or central authorities. And mm -hmm. a lot of it breaks out in the cryptocurrency space where people feel like they're, you know, sort of participating in a different type of world where I usually sort of caution them and, and say, hey, pump the brakes. Decentralization is great, but it doesn't yank power completely away from any power structure today. It kind of just forces that power to be, you know, more distributed and not just in the hands of a, of a handful of rich people. So I, I think that ideology attracts a lot of people. Yep. And as far as crypto goes, um, it's actually a currency, which means you can buy things with it. Um, and that, it's not just purely a, a hold or buy and hold, which may be one of the reasons why the price keeps going up is people buy and hold in, in, in anticipation of it going higher. But so if someone decides they want to go to uh, some store, and buy something. I think those like a home goods or something like that, or, or home Depot accepted Bitcoin. And someone goes in there and buys some sheets today and um, they spend like what 0.5 Bitcoin on, on some sheets, really expensive sheets. Wow. So, or 0 0.001 on, on sheets. And then next week they go back to return those sheets and they want their, their the exact number of Bitcoin back. That's not going to happen because I guess his owner says that he's not going to let his uh, his sheets be a hedge against the uh, the Bitcoin. I think it's it's perfectly reasonable in, in a transaction like that where you know people might argue store of value versus currency. This is one of the reasons why. But if Home Depot was saying, "Okay, we're going to not refund you the transaction fee that you paid to send us this value, um, charge you a fifteen percent restocking fee because clearly those sheets are very expensive." And then further, there's a transaction fee for us sending the Bitcoin back to you. You're responsible for that as well. I think that's an unfortunate paradigm, but it makes complete sense. And you're, you're going to see that more often people questioning, hey, do we actually want to integrate this at a retail level? I do think there's lots of cryptocurrency and digital asset products that are great for transacting in that way. But as Bitcoin changes over time, it's going to establish itself less as a currency and, and more as a kind of gold as uh, Powell recently said, um, there's a there's a couple reasons why you wouldn't want to, to use it so transactionally. But um, to those who do, I, I definitely support it. It's just you have to be ready for those cost caveats that I mentioned earlier. You know, transaction fees in both directions, and then potentially a processing fee from the uh, you know from from the the the, uh, the purchaser side, I guess you could call it, because they're the ones responsible for the uh, the asset in the meanwhile. And so in a situation, if you are a business or because we're actually thinking about maybe considering taking Bitcoin as payment. But if there's a refund involved, um, couldn't we just refund them in, in cash 
okay, this you spent um, five hundred dollars on this product um, or this this piece of equipment. Uh, we're going to return that to you in, in U.S. dollars as opposed to Bitcoin or, or my, any it, crypto. It's my understanding that that's a little bit more tenuous when it comes to taxation because you'd be taking a hit on the conversion of that cryptocurrency. But if you're accepting Bitcoin and selling cash, meaning you have a, a service like BitPay, uh, where they you know let you accept Bitcoin and then immediately provide you U.S. dollars behind, then I can see how it doesn't make sense for you to go buy some Bitcoin to give back to that person who wants a refund. But um, disclaimer, I, I'm not a tax professional. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how that would work. But um, I, I think that accepting Bitcoin is valuable. But I also encourage people to have very strict policies around it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I think that if you were you know, accepting Bitcoin for values less than, say, $100, then you know you you should be putting disclaimers that say hey there's this and that fee and you know you might need to wait five days and there you know the transaction itself is something that we're not responsible for that we will provide you the transaction id so you can track it there's um th there's a lot of people experimenting in the space that aren't requiring a lot from the the purchaser or at the point of purchase and i think signing a simple eula or just agreeing to a simple hey i understand this is how this is going to go if this then that that's, you know, that's about as polite as you can be about it. It's just, hey, disclaimer, this is how we do business. You know, if you need a refund, then you receive it in cash, that sort of thing. I think that's really fine. So here is a here's another disclaimer. This is a uh, my, my nephew, um, who is a uh, millennial. Um, so his question is, do you think Bitcoin will ever be more useful tool for transferring value? than fiat currency. And fiat currency is basically what uh, regular money is, is to us uh, gen or to to us um, what am I? Millennial? Am I a... Anyway, so <clears throat> baby boomer. So that's that's basically a currency. Uh, if Bitcoin never becomes more useful than transact transferring value, then how do you determine its intrinsic value? And then I think is mostly there is because there's a limited amount, but I'll let you finish the answering the, the question. There is absolutely a finite amount, and, and I, I'd like to, to dig into that in a moment. But um, to be clear, I, I don't think that Bitcoin needs to replace fiat currency. I, I think that it's perfectly logical that we would have an Internet of Money kind of posture in the next few years. And, and this is already more normal to other countries like in the EU where they, you know, accept EUR, but might also have Kronen or some other um you know some other currency that they take they're more used to exchanging frequently you know some vendors accept some things some vendors don't um i've i've made the case to people that it's very much going to be dependent on the ui the user interface that most people use so if you have a color wheel that you can flip through and say okay i feel like paying in dogecoin today i'm not a fan of dogecoin but this person who i want to tip is asking me for tips in dogecoin so i'm going to select okay dogecoin and pay I think that's the posture that we're moving towards. Um, interoperability between blockchains is the main thing that I, I think is really interesting in the space because it increases the utility tenfold to be able to bounce back and forth between different networks and, and do things and achieve things that today you pretty much have to pay more money and jump through more hoops to do on a, a cloud platform like Google, Amazon, Microsoft. But um, that's that's more the, the intrinsic value sort of angle, I, I don't like to use the word intrinsic, but I use the word utilitarian value because having digitally portable gold is, is I think, extremely useful. And there's a lot of things you can do with that. There's people talking about an identity system for Bitcoin. Uh, people are looking at building out art on top of a layer on top of Bitcoin. Um, there, there's really a lot of value in that utility. I think that's the argument you would make in, in moving towards that uh, intrinsic conversation. But I want to talk about the, the scalability, the limited supply, as, as you mentioned. Um, it, it makes a lot of people uncomfortable to do the real numbers on this because there's more than 7 million Bitcoin that are uh, expected to be lost that just haven't moved in so many years that you know may never move again. Those Bitcoin that I mined in 2014, uh, the key was deleted. So I will never have access to those Bitcoin. And I've come to peace with that. But that also means that that's part of that. 7 million. So when you when you do the numbers on circulating supply and, and Willy Wu on Twitter is a really excellent source of information on this. Um, you can see that we're looking at, you know, less than 10 million Bitcoin total circulation, probably about uh, three to five million left that are actually going to be mined and then interacted with by people. 
that really raises the question, as you said, scalability, right? You know, there's a very limited supply. How can this work for everyone? Well, there, there's two important things to know. One, uh, Bit, one Bitcoin makes into 100 million Satoshis. Satoshis are effectively Bitcoin pennies. So that's the smallest unit inside one Bitcoin. This is what's most commonly talked about as, oh, well, that's the lowest common denominator. That's not actually true. And depending on what platforms you go on, you can see this as well. There is such thing as a millisat, which is 1,000th of one Satoshi. So I think when we talk about global scalability, it's important to recognize that while there are other things that can be done with code upgrades and, you know, we can change mining pools around and, you know, we can adjust the way that the, the code works, that it's even possible to change the supply, though I'm sure nobody would, um, that it's important to acknowledge that there is potential in, in scaling it and there is scalability available for it today, as is. So that millisat factor is, is something you can see. And if you look at that number and you break out um, total millisats on Bitcoin. Um, I think if you look at the number available, it's roughly comparable to what triple the international U.S. cash supply. It's it's estimated that five hundred billion dollars in cash circulates outside the U.S. Uh, in, as of twenty eighteen. So going off of that, you can say that there's definitely a a significant amount of you know smallest denominations of currency to to be utilized. So there's um there's other arguments that I could make that are a little bit more advanced about uh, Bitcoin's code changing or Bitcoin core being only 0 0.21. It's still very young code. Um, but um, I don't think we need to go that deep into it to acknowledge that, yeah, it's it's reasonable to say that Bitcoin's, um, you know, limited supply is, is both a benefit and a challenge going forward. But then again, um, there are other cryptocurrencies other than uh, Bitcoin. Um, second in line is uh, Ethereum. And then there's another uh, like what BitLite or, or was it Litecoin? Litecoin. Mm -hmm. And so there are other options. It's basically like, are you trading gold? Are you trading silver? Are you playing, trading platinum? Or are you trading stocks? Um, there are other options out there that um, you don't have to invest into a single coin. Although Bitcoin seems to be um, the gold standard, the first um, viable um, crypto. Yeah, Bitcoin is the oldest cryptocurrency and, and the oldest public blockchain of its kind. It's about 11 years old. Um, Litecoin comes next at nine years old. It is a Bitcoin fork. Um, but there, there's definitely a, you know, a, a correlation you could make. A lot of people in the space have recently been comparing Ethereum to petrol, to oil, because Ethereum is more about what you can do with it than what the price of it is at the moment. Um, Litecoin, I, I do like making the argument of, you know, silver to gold as Litecoin is sort of Bitcoin's gold. Um, disclaimer, I'm, I'm very uh, interested in Litecoin. I like using it. I like operating on it. Um, I, I admin a Facebook group of 55,000 people about it. I, um, I, I think that it's reasonable to look at the space when you're trying to get your bearings, especially if you come from stocks, to say, okay, how can I compare this? How can I get a better, you know, sort of macro understanding of these products or these concepts? And um, Litecoin being the silver to, to Bitcoin's gold, there, there's different, more detailed things about the development and the, de the technology, the signatures. But at a very base level, Litecoin is the second oldest blockchain product, and it is designed to be extremely efficient. The, uh, the fees were reduced by 90% in late 2019, though the transactions are extremely cheap. And people don't know that Litecoin actually has smart contracts. So uh, one of my uh, apps that I like to use that I, I'm, again, this is not financial advice. I'm not recommending this platform specifically, but though I am um, friendly with the CEO, um, Bill's really excellent. But the, the point is, sorry, um, Abra, when it initially launched, used a system that I called Litecoin Cloud. Basically, it was using Litecoin smart contracts interacting with each other to manage other cryptocurrencies. So the idea is relatively simple. Um, when you have other cryptocurrency wallets, they don't have to be stored locally on your phone as an app. You could just have the data needed to operate those wallets stored somewhere else. And Litecoin is a very cheap and efficient way to store those private keys to store that information that you need and then just pull it down with your own private key whenever you open the app. So there's, there's a lot of utility in smart contracts. They do also exist on Bitcoin, but they're pretty clunky. So I, I think that when you're talking about the, the sort of intrinsic value, the, the space general and assessing the technologies, um, the utility and the ability and the reliability is a, is a pretty decent like three items to be looking at 
of how useful is this, how valuable is this, you know, how much would I be interested in participating in this concept, you know, because it's beneficial to me, because it makes sense to me. That that doesn't mean you need to go write your own Litecoin smart contracts, but it does mean that you might, you know, see some benefits in particular from a fast network or from, uh, you know, being able to sign certain transactions or in the case of Ethereum, to be able to go interact with certain projects, because goodness knows there's thousands of projects on a building on Ethereum. So, as far as a smart contract, are you just saying is like a, like in stocks, you put a, a loss um, order in there. So, if it goes below this amount, sell it. Is that what you're talking about? Smart, smart contracts. That's one use case for sure. Smart contracts are really just um, code that I think the easiest way I could describe it is if this, then that. It's just a structure of hey, we want to set these, you know, sort of prerequisites. We want to set the stage with these parameters. And then when somebody does this, this operation will happen. So that, that can be translated in a bunch of different ways. And there's uh, the burning of tokens and the creation of tokens and tokens being moved between people and data being changed in the smart contract itself. Um, there's entire organizations that can be built, like a DAO is called a decentralized autonomous organization. That basically means you write a smart contract that sets a list of, of rules and descriptions that, hey, if you vote by taking action, then the organization is obliged to do this and it's enforceable because this contract holds the keys to do that action. So that it, it can get really complicated and hairy, but I don't mean to get in the weeds on it. Um, it's it's a pretty flexible concept and the technology itself is used differently on different platforms. So Ethereum has the sort of uh, first mover advantage, but because they had the first mover advantage for so long, uh, other projects have been forced to sort of accommodate their Ethereum virtual machine technology. And that means that lots of different projects are compatible with Ethereum, uh, even if they don't operate on Ethereum's infrastructure. So that's, that's a pretty important dynamic to consider when you're looking at smart contracts is, okay, is an Ethereum smart contract in Solidity more interesting to me than a Cardano smart contract run in Haskell, or um, you know, there's Rust that you can run on Ravencoin and all these other platforms. Um, I, I do encourage people to see it as sort of the building blocks for a new uh, serverless cloud, because that's the easiest way I think to describe, you know, hey, I, I might have eight lines of code, but I want that to constantly exist out in the world and do what it's supposed to do. Um, there's nothing wrong with using a regular cloud service for that. That's what most businesses are going to do today. Mm -hmm. But, you know, some businesses want that extra flexibility and, and they do recognize that uh, blockchain projects, even younger ones, frequently have lower downtime than cloud infrastructure. So I got a question. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, IT security. Um, let's define what, how do you actually keep your um, crypto available to you? If there are a number of different ways, um, how would you describe those? So the most important thing is hand over fist to have a wallet strategy. A lot of people, um, especially where I spend time these days on Clubhouse, are very excited about hardware wallets and multi-signature applications where you need like three different keys out of the total of five to move your Bitcoin. There's a lot of different things you can do that are, are high level security at the point of the wallet. Uh, my personal position is a little bit um, in the other direction. I uh, like to coach people on digital hygiene. I think that if you're going to have a sovereign and digital control of your assets, that means that you need to recognize that you've, you know, now become more valuable as a as a digital entity online. You know, if your email has the power to reset a password for a platform where you have ten thousand dollars sort of virtually stored, then suddenly that email is kind of worth ten G's. It's a you know it's a, it's a risk paradigm to say, okay, I do want to have custody of my own assets. I don't want somebody else to custody those assets. But then I'm responsible for my own personal security because I'm my own bank at this point. So um, I think that the strategy is the number one thing. Um, I, I am using more than 20 wallet products. I experiment with a lot. I don't like having all of my money in one place in the event that something went wrong. But I, I think the most important thing is a strategy and, and most people are gonna build that in the context of a hot wallet where they do most of their transactions. Um, a, a sort of warm or a medium wallet where they would have you know stuff that they would touch once a month, once every few months and then a cold storage mechanism of some type where you pretty much only send money into it and never pull money out of it or never as best you can, right? So there's a lot of interesting things you can do and, and hardware wallets are certainly increasing in popularity, but I don't recommend them to people because the space is very young. 
And I do know a few device security engineers that, you know, will, will actively tell you, hey, there's four little, you know, pins on this board. If you can solder to these four little points on this board, then you've got a decent chance to, you know, see somebody passing their password in clear text and technical nonsense like that, that someone could basically break into your um, cold wallet. As a concept, it's, it's sorry, hardware wallet, not cold wallet. As a concept, it's, it's pretty reasonable to say that, um, the, uh, the the strength of that cold wallet, the strength of that security is only as valuable as the um, dependencies around it, right? So if you are putting all of your money onto this little ledger or treasure, this little physical device, and you carry that around with you in your pocket constantly, you're just moving that risk and threat surface to your physical person. I'm um, mm -hmm. not saying people are going to get kidnapped with their crypto, though it's not unheard of, but a lot of people don't realize what they're getting into when they move all of their digital assets in that physical form because they're not acknowledging where the sort of um, security caveats come in for instance the i believe it's the ledger nano x that has a, a bluetooth module on it so that wireless interface is now a threat surface bluetooth is a relatively easy technology to hack there's a bunch of unpatched vulnerabilities out there so you know, it's a different type of uh, risk engagement where you're saying, okay, well, I, I want to move to a hardware wallet because I was told that's secure. Okay, but how are you applying that security is really the question. So um, I, I would say that the most important thing in having a, a, a cohesive and sensible wallet strategy is, you know, keep it simple enough for you, but obfuscated enough so that if someone else, say, took over your email, that they would struggle to figure things out. And a lot of people in the past have lost their money over complicating things. So it's important to note that security is is easy to sort of bury yourself under, and um, if you if you manage risk in a compartmentalized way, it's a lot easier than just saying, okay, well this is my bag of crypto, I'm just going to cling to it, and you know mm -hmm. I'll feel safe because I have a hardware wallet. That's not always the 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 most reasonable practice, if you ask me. So great, um, we've run our half hour, a little bit more. This is really interesting, and we're only t touching the surface. Um, Tim wants to know how we can get in touch with you. Um, is there an email or do you want, or is there, can you reach out to you through uh, Instagram or what's the best way to contact you? I'm a, I'm a relatively public person on the internet. My name is Sheldon Deer, the E-A-R-R. -R. You can find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I'm on Clubhouse pretty frequently, but um, I don't mean to, uh, to give out my personal information, but if you search my first and last name, first of all, you find a bunch of hilarious pictures from me as a teenager. But um, it's pretty easy to find my my LinkedIn. And if we haven't met before and if we haven't engaged in a social platform, that's usually my default just to be professional. Okay, so basically DM you or maybe follow you on Instagram and uh, tag you and you'll respond back if uh, you're available. Type disclaimer, disclaimer, I'm rarely on Instagram, but uh, LinkedIn okay. I check every day. Um, Twitter I check every day. Okay. I'm, I'm very findable there. Okay, and then Clubhouse. Yeah, I mean, you've gotten a great, great information. I've been in a number of your rooms on Clubhouse. I'm learning more about this every day. Um, disclaimer: I'm not invested at all. I haven't bought any Bitcoin yet. Um, it looks interesting. Um, I know other countries are looking into integrating some of these cryptocurrencies into their regular currencies. Um, as we mentioned before, um, there are funds that you can buy into, some companies that you can buy into that are investing in crypto in some way. So those are ways you can actually invest in this. Again, talk to your professional advisor um, for anything before investing. And uh, diversify is, is another key word. Absolutely agree. I, I, I made sure to have my, my low risk investments and my stocks as I wanted to feel comfortable with them long term before I moved into crypto. And I, I do recommend that very, very consistently for young people that like, hey, build your low risk positions first. Don't jump into the high risk stuff because you want to make money. Do some risk modeling. Is your risk tolerance such that you can be very comfortable sleeping at night losing $10,000? Okay, well, congratulations. You must be doing fairly well. But um, I, I think that's not the case for most younger folk and, and they don't really uh, feel the need to pivot to that sort of you know, risk assessment, risk modeling considerations. Um, until they they take it on the chin at least once. That's that's what I've observed. And then there are other platforms like Acorn, 
where you can put in ten dollars a week into a stock or into a fund there and you're buying uh, micro portions of, of uh, stocks and building your portfolio there yeah i was an avid user of, of acorns i retired from using the platform to to focus more on other investments but I sent them a message basically, hey, I'm leaving the platform because cryptocurrency and digital assets are not an option here. Still love your product, still recommend people to you guys, but I want to focus more on digital assets. So Acorns is definitely a good uh, product for, for that. Um, there are alternatives that you, know, you could schedule purchases on different platforms like Swan Bitcoin or Cash App to say, okay, I, I want to spend $10 a month to make sure I'm consistently accumulating a digital asset. And I, I do that. I do recommend that. But again, you know, don't invest what you're not willing to lose. That's just, you know, that that's basics. I'm sure you're more than familiar. Yep, definitely. Thank you. You've been wonderful. Uh, hope to have you on again with a more more uh, in depth conversation. Here's another um, express uh, disclaimer that anything we talked about is not an endorsement of any product or service that we uh, we talked about. And hit pause to uh, to read this fully. And uh, you've been a great great guest. And uh, talk to you soon. Thanks so much for having me, Bruce. It's been excellent. Talk soon. Excellent.